All right. Good evening. Good evening, y'all. So my name is um, Mark Neil Bautista. I'm, I am from SFC Florida. Any SFC Florida people out there? It's like, can you just give me a thumbs up, like as a reaction? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, one flow. All right. So just not to be confused with everyone. So tonight, we're going to be doing Love Your Neighbor. So if this is the workshop that you guys are planning to attend, this is the right workshop. This is the Love Your Neighbor. And also, um, also thank you to Sister Jeshrin and Sister Cece for leading the rosary. That was actually pretty good. Thank you very much. And um, all right. So let's do like um, a little bit of like the background about the workshop. So the workshop is about, um, let's open with a Bible verse from Mark chapter 12, verse 30 to 31. Jesus tells us that the two greatest commandments are to love God and to love our neighbor. In today's turbulent times, what does the church and our Catholic faith tell us about loving our neighbor by addressing and racing, uh, racism and social injustice? This workshop will help us to, uh, will, uh, to more fully understand Jesus' commandment and how we can take actions against racism as Catholics. Also, I wanted to introduce to you our speaker, um, Reverend Stephen Thorn. For this workshop, it's going to be a pre-recorded uh, interview, which was in, uh, initially conducted specifically for the CFC Youth um, National Conference. And we reached out to the same speaker and several others, but unfortunately, none were available to join us today. After a careful review, discussion, and discernment, this interview was actually deemed applicable to us as SFCs. There are only a few instances where the speaker will mention youth, but it is still re relevant to us as adults and young adults. So don't forget about that. So afterwards, we'll have a member of our CFC Gift of Life National Core Group to talk about some concrete steps we can take as a community. Now, without further ado, Father Stephen Thorne is a priest of the Diocese of uh, Philadelphia, ordained in 1998. He has served as parish priest administrator and educator. From 2004-2011, Father served as executive director of the Office for Black Catholics for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Presently, he serves as the pastor of St. Martin de Porres Catholic Church in North Philadelphia and faculty of Newman University. Also, he's a consultant and speaker on issues of race, racial healing in the church. All right, are you guys ready for the talk? All right, let's give it away. Hello, brothers and sisters, welcome. Uh, my name is Patrick Cornell. I'm a lay missionary for CFC Youth USA and welcome to the Call of the Church on Social Injustices Workshop. Thank you for coming here. And I know that we've got youth from all over US and Canada who uh, from the killing of George Floyd, which was uh, over th was three months ago, um, as with the rest of the country, we were quickly made aware of the depth, the depth of social injustice due to racism uh, that our black brothers and sisters have been facing. And since then, many of us were frustrated, angered, we sought out answers, we tried to take what action we could, we prayed, we learned, and I think as a majority Filipino community, uh, guidance from firsthand experience was not common. It was difficult. We really had to make an extra effort to seek that out. And that is why we are really, really blessed to have our guest speaker for our workshop today. He is a priest from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Go Eagles, ordained in 1998, has served as a parish priest, administrator, and educator from 2004 to 2011. Uh, he served as ed executive director of the Office of for Black Catholics for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Presently, he serves at the, as the pastor of St. Martin de Porras Catholic Church in North Philadelphia and faculty at Newman University. And he is a consultant and speaker on issues of racial healing in the church, which is what makes him so perfect as our guest speaker today. So let's welcome Reverend Stephen Thorne. Thank you, Patrick. Hello, everybody. Good to be with you. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Reverend Stephen, for, for joining us. Uh, we're, we're really excited. Maybe is there a, a little bit about yourself that you could share before we start? 
you, you know, you mentioned uh, that this is a majority of uh, Filipino brothers and sisters together, and so it's wonderful. I was pastor of St. Therese Parish uh, in Mount Airy, Philadelphia, uh, for three years, three happy years, my first time being a pastor. And we had a fiat prayer group there, and uh, they gathered every Friday, and I was a Filipino community gathered for prayer and fellowship, and they had the best food in the world. <laughs> they took care of me, so I really enjoyed uh, being with them. They're wonderful people, and they were part of our family, and I really enjoyed um, And I remember we got a, a beautiful statue. I said, what is the, what's the best way to bring the culture into our parish? And uh, we got a little Santo Nino, the, the, yeah. image, <laughs> the child. And uh, we had that in prominent place in our church, and uh, he took care of us. So happy to be with you today. So great to be with you. Oh, that's so, that's so cool to hear. Thank you, Father. Um, so on behalf of CFC Youth USA and Canada community, again, we want to thank you, Father Stephen, for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, even three months later, uh, we have so many questions. Uh, we sent out a survey um, to all of our uh, youth uh, registrants for this conference, and uh, it was over five pages of questions when we just put them all in a line. And so we'll be asking you questions curated from everything that the youth had sent in. So I'm here not to add to the discussion by any means, but simply just to be a mouthpiece for all of the questions expressed by the youth. And then uh, I'll just ask the question and then join in taking this opportunity to just listen and learn from you. <laughs> So the first uh, question, just to start at, at the start and not so much the beginning of the overall issue, but just the start of the spark that really sparked the worldwide protest and social unrest. Uh, what was your personal experience and reaction to the killing of George Floyd? Patrick, and to all the, the young people who are with us, um, I identify obviously as, as a man of faith. I'm a Catholic, uh, born and raised, uh, lifelong, part of my family's heritage. Uh, and I very much am, am pro-life. I mean, there's just no other way to be. Um, my faith, um, the scriptures, uh, demands me to believe that all life is sacred to God. And so when I watched um, the murder, and I use that word specifically of George Floyd, um, back in May, um, I was heartbroken um, because uh, it was such a, horrible example of the disrespect for life. And again, as somebody who believes that life is sacred from the moment of conception, to the moment of natural death, um, no matter what a person may be accused of or done, um, that, that scene of eight minutes and 46 seconds of um, the officer's knee on the neck of, of George Floyd as he was pleading for his life, just cried out, um, uh, cried out to me and, and, and touched me very deeply. Uh, in my heart. Um, ironically, the Sunday after that was Pentecost Sunday, and we heard uh, Jesus breathe on his disciples and, and gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit. So breath is, is, is a sacred reality. That's how we, we know we're alive, we're, by breathing. Um, once the breath stops, then we have, we, we are, our, our soul and body have been separated. In, in, a, in a tradition of, of the scriptures, Ruah is the, is the word for breath. So that, that, that somewhere between that encounter uh, and George Floyd's body being on the ground and, and his being suffocated, losing life and crying out for his mother, um, it was very painful. And, and it, it's one of many examples. It's, it's, it was very profound because it was such a very magnified example of, of uh, what we see in terms of police brutality and, 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 and systemic racism. Um, but it happens all the time. It wasn't the first time we've seen that, but it was such a magnified reality. And it led us to spaces like this, where we are talking about the reality of, 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 um, of racism as, as it's, and it's its ugliest form. But to answer your question specifically, it's simply, uh, again, to repeat myself, uh, I was just horrified. And I knew I had to do something. I could not just sit back and say a prayer or say that was a shame. But what is my responsibility as a man who, um, who's a Catholic priest and a leader and believes all life is sacred. Thank you for sharing that, Father. 
Um, you mentioned that it was a part of, uh, it wasn't just that moment that sort of sparked the protest, but that it's because it's part of a bigger, uh, you mentioned systemic racism. And I think that's something everybody's been looking for information on. So what is systemic and institutional racism and how does that violate the dignity of human life? Sure. U.S. bishops wrote a letter two years ago, Open Wide Our Hearts. And in that they talk about how racism appears in many ways. It's personal, it's institutional, it's systemic, um, internalized. So there's different ways it shows up when we disrespect and, and, and specifically do things, actions that uh, hold one race against another. And for, for, for me and for African Americans, that has been seen in many, many ways. And uh, systemic, literally, it's part of the system, it's part of the institutions, it's baked in um, in, in, in form, and we don't really realize sometimes of how it is part of who we are. I've often used um, uh, the analogy, uh, I'm not a smoker, we should not smoke. It's not a good thing for our bodies. Um, if I'm around someone who is a smoker and I'm breathing in that air and I'm having that person breathe and put smoke in, around me, my clothes, my, my body, I'm gonna have it in my lungs. And so we, we breathe in the toxicity of racism institutionally. And we know that uh, the organizations, and, um, groups, and even sadly, our church that has participated in the reality of racism. Georgetown University, the oldest Catholic university in our country, a wonderful institution, um, was built with slaves. There were slaves there who were owned. People enslaved Africans were part of the founding and, and, and baked in that institution um, in this reality. So it's been part of who we are. And we see it today, whether it's in hiring practices, we see it in other institutions and things that we see that continue to keep people of color outside of equality that should be part of, of the process. And so uh, it is something that has been part of us and sadly even part of who we are as a church. And that's why it's so incumbent upon us to do everything possible to eradicate racism from our experience. Thank you, Father. Uh, and just to continue there, so you're saying a, a responsibility, especially as a church, I think for our community, we were, or and still continue to look for guidance beyond outside of our community and more so from the church uh, with uh, how we can uh, approach this. So how does the church specifically approach racial injustice and how do church leaders respond to such issues? Sure. Um, our church is, 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 is very blessed to have a long tradition, over 2,000 years, and we're very, very good at writing documents. The, the, church is, the church has condemned racism and the slave trade many, many times. So the document the bishops wrote last two years ago but was not new. Uh, in fact, it, it quoted many things, the catechism, et cetera, previous documents. So our bishops have spoken out many times. The challenge is, um, is to, 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 to live it. So we, we have the doc, that's why the church should lead this conversation because we have everything we need to, to move forward. We just have to begin to put it not just in our head, but in our hearts. And that's why the bishops, I think appropriately call the document, open wide our hearts. We can change laws and we've done that. Um, but changing hearts is difficult. And that's why it takes great faith and, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit and this, the, the, our young people are the hope of this. Uh, and even in the midst of the, the terrible protests, Archbishop Perez, who is my Archbishop in Philadelphia, he, he spoke many times about the peaceful protesters, the people who were there raising up their constitutional rights to, 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 to speak up. Um, it was beautiful to see that it really was an, an inclusive group. And there were many white people and black people and brown people and you know, all the rainbow peoples together speaking as sad, and a lot of them were young. And so that's why I have great hope in the midst of all of this, uh, the terrible injustice that the church has great hope in our youth. And as we begin to continue to, to connect to each other, relate to each other, and to realize um, uh, the strength that comes from that, um, that's gonna be great to, to move us in the direction of Christ because um, you cannot call yourself a Christian you cannot call yourself a faithful Catholic and harbor racism in your heart. It, it doesn't exist. I, I always uh, joke and say, not really joking at all, but I, I, I 
talk about we were right now in a world and experience where our, our food situation, we don't really have our, the fullness of going to dinner, but uh, in the kingdom of God, we go to the, the, the eternal banquet table, you won't get indoor seating, outdoor seating, or even, <laughs> and even drive-by service. You can't get any of that if you're a racist. So you, you cannot be part of the great banquet of the Lord if you have the, you're going to be put out. So we have to always do our best here on earth to build the beloved kingdom. Thank you, Father. Um, it, w- do you have other uh, examples, too, of, of, of just uh, outside of the documents uh, where you've witnessed uh, churches or church leaders uh, like tangible responses or approaches to addressing racial injustice? Sure. You know, actually, one of the, uh, I preached a um, homily recently that there's a message in the mess. And uh, I guess being a, a hopeful person in, in the mess of what we've seen in the horrible reality of, um, of racial injustice and racism uh, that has shown its ugly head and, and it come to a, a terrible reality. We've seen so much good news and, and um, it's things like today, you know, we probably would not be having this conversation today and having this workshop and the wonderful conference you're, you're having uh, this weekend if it weren't for a horrible event. Uh, it goes back to our faith that the, the, the worst event was, was this, the Friday when Jesus Christ was crucified, but yet we know that is the crux of, of our, our, the new life that comes from his resurrection. That being said, I've seen many opportunities where people are having conversations. My parish is predominantly African-American. We partnered with a predominantly white parish in the suburbs, we're in the inner city, and we had a wonderful, um, basically an open conversation, a town hall meeting on race. It was great because we're not gonna move ahead on racism we're just black on black, or white on white, or Filipino on Filipino. We have to bring as many people to the conversation as possible. So that one town hall has blossomed to a focus group of, of people from St. John's and St. Martin's meeting together monthly to strategize, to work together. Um, I was part of a, a, a series of, of a group of, of white Catholics who wanted to be informed and enlightened. It was a four part series on how they can better understand the, the reality of what African Americans have endured in our nation. I was part of that series uh, this past uh, four weeks ago. Um, and, and other events as well. We see so much happening in our schools, in our college campuses. We're seeing uh, people really beginning to, to, to engage conversations. And that's critical. Uh, it's when we, under, we read and we, we have conversation and we have relationships. That's how we're going to affect the change that Christ wants to see in us um, is we relate to each other. And that's, it's such a, uh, the irony is that right now we're in a, with this COVID-19 space, we cannot have our normal lives, relationships of being face-to-face with each other and not just on a screen, but uh, to, to hug and to shake hands and to, to engage each other. Um, but our God does not practice social distancing. Our God is a close God. And Jesus Christ, um, he comes not as a tweet, or, or a, a chat or an email, he comes in the flesh. Um, I saw on your website, Emmanuel, God is with us. And he comes in the flesh to do what? To encounter. And the more we can have sacred encounters, Pope Francis says, the more we can get to know each other and love each other as we should. Wow. Oh, thank you so much, Father, for that. Um, I think uh, one encounter that... Uh, especially for our youth and uh, quarantined at home, um, we're finding a difficulty, a varying difficulty with was encountering their families on this issue. Um, uh, for those of us whose parents grew up not in the U.S., there was a very different cultural upbringing and experience. Um, what are some ways that we can have those healthy conversations and encounters about racial injustice with our families, especially when we have different perspectives and backgrounds? It's a great point. And even among African Americans, there's a generational divide of how people perhaps, um, even just like you look at John Lewis, who just passed away, his whole approach to nonviolence and being a man who was 80 years old and was formed in a very different time. Um, mm-hmm very different than what we might see today in terms of how people will go about uh, seeking justice. So that interracial, gener- intergenerational divide is, is, is not just in, in one community, um, but you're right. I think the, the key thing is, uh, is to read. I think one of the gifts we have now 
is be able to use technology. There are, there are go on websites, we can find all kinds of wonderful opportunities that are there. The National Black Catholic Congress uh, in Baltimore, uh, I, I used to work for the Congress and very much involved in the Congress activities. It's kind of the umbrella of all African American Catholic affairs. They have a great series of opportunities that are available on their Facebook page, their website, you can look and see. It helps understand. And the more we can see the reality uh, and have that sense of compassion and empathy, understand what it's like to be the other, I think it helps us to um, appreciate the life of what African Americans have endured and, and, and um, the challenges that they, they face, that we face. I teach a course and part of the course I teach on cultural diversity is I invite my students to place themselves as the other. And that could be all kinds of realities. But for example, I'm a man who's blessed to be very I'm mobile. I have no physical disabilities, praise God. But if I'm with a, someone who's confined to a wheelchair, it makes me under, first appreciate my mobility, but also understand what's it like to not be able to get to the pulpit to read the, God's word because there's too many steps. If I'm a person who um, is an outsider for, um, for language, and my first language is not English, what is it like to try to move about and try to translate? Um, I, I went to Paris uh, on a beautiful pilgrimage a few years ago, and I, I was being bold, and I went out to take a, a nice walk, and I speak zero French. <laughs> I got scared to death because I couldn't mess with the bathroom because I couldn't speak French. But it gave me a real understanding and appreciation and empathy for those who come to, to America who perhaps do not speak English very well. So that being said, the more we can find opportunities to engage, to listen, I think that's important. So I, I really, I would hope our older people, we need their, their strength and their wisdom, but the, the, to listen is important. And also we need to speak up and speak with kindness. Uh, that's critical because that's how the conversation takes place. I had a conversation with my nephew who's much younger than myself and he had a very strong opinion about one thing and I had a very strong opinion. And my sister was so brilliant. She says, you know, you're both saying the same thing. So when I began to listen to what he was saying and, and he listened to what I was saying, we came to an understanding. So I think listening is critical as we begin to heal some of our generational divides that we have with each other. Uh, and appreciate each other and, and to be open to, uh, because I believe that the, 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 the plight of, of racism that has affected over 400 years of African Americans, um, it's seen in other places too. We've seen other people have been, ex have been experienced discrimination and, 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 and prejudice has, has shown up in other ways, not to the degree of what we did to enslaved Africans. Uh, I can call that as one of our first original sins um, as a country. Uh, but certain other people can identify what it's like to be left out. Our, our women, just a uh, hundred years ago, were given the right to vote, was ratified in this country. So what we have done to, to women and not allowing them and permitting them to be full partakers in the political process. So um, all that I think is helpful when we begin to build relationships with each other. Thank you, Father. Um, an experience that some of the youth have had uh, in trying to talk to their parents or maybe others is, I think, the uh, maybe a, a hesit hesitancy to to listen from the other, uh, this, the receiving side doesn't want to receive or be open to that conversation. And uh, I think, uh, you know, how can they approach that conversation, whether it's with their family or with others that they don't want to even listen or have that conversation? Never to give up, never to lose hope. I think it's, um, we would be, as, as a pastor, as an educator, and someone who works with young people on, on college campus, uh, I would be a fool today if I'm gonna try to minister and not listen. And so I, I try to do, uh, my mother often said to me, Stephen, you have two ears and one mouth. So God is trying to tell you it's more listening than, than speaking. Um, but our young people are a gift. And this, this conference is a gift. And I'm just so inspired by what I've learned about this uh, organization and what you're doing to bring young people to Christ and to bring Christ message to them. And, and, and families and, and the development and the different programs you have. 
it, it is the, the strength of our church, our society. So we would be wise to, to listen. And um, for those who are foolish not to want to listen, and listen does not mean necessarily that you have to always agree. But it, it does mean that we, we, we're open to growth and open to learning. And I know myself as a lifelong learner, I, I don't have it all figured out myself. I'm, I'm still learning myself. And I, I, I learn all the time from experiences. And so I really would encourage um, our young people never to give up and to continue to have those conversations, even if they're difficult, to, to continue to say and, and find ways to, to engage. Because um, I, I think we, we want to see, uh, especially this issue was so critical. And we want to see, um, we saw those painful experiences of protests that were destructive, uh, that tore down, that, that, that created so much violence and so much destruction. It came from a place of pain. And, and we don't want to see it repeated. We want people to, to raise up their, their voices as they should, uh, but do it in a way that's really going to be constructive, that's going to really move about um, and make it to vote and to do the things that are so necessary to bring about change. And uh, that happens when we do listen to each other more effectively. Thank you, Father. I think the, what you mentioned that uh, it came from a place of pain and for uh, some of the youth, um, that pain or, or frustration of not being heard uh, came out in a, what we dub as cancel culture. So just sort of really calling out and uh, getting angry at somebody in that conversation that they were trying to, you know, initially have, H how would you, is there a certain approach to starting that conversation uh, to not get immediately, uh, you know, to turn to anger or, yeah. or, you know, to not hear each other? Sure. Sure. It's tough. It's a tough one. I mean, when people are, uh, are frustrated and they, they feel they've not been heard, and they feel that there's no other opportunities available, um, uh, the destruction happens. And that's where we need the, the leadership to create those spaces and, um, and places that are really going to be, uh, again, I go back to my experience on college campus, where we, we can't just simply react to things, mm -hmm. but trying to be responsive with it. Um, the work of, of racial healing and the work of, of, of understanding diversity and culture should not just be a reaction to something bad. Hmm. Um, this, I think it heightens it. But we should be doing racial healing and diversity and cultural where all those things should be happening all the time, especially in our Catholic spaces. So our church we profess every Sunday is one holy Catholic apostolic. And that's, that's, what, that's what marks the church. And so because it is Catholic, universal, because it is holy, because Christ is holy, these conversations should be happening on a regular basis, and it's where we need to really provide. Uh, and so conferences like this, this is where people can be informed and inspired to, to do the work that needs to be done and to channel perhaps the anger into constructive things, things that help build up. And so um, when someone, so how can we really get people to come together and to work together with each other and put that energy in, in the right place? We need the energy of that but done in a way that is constructive. I go back to the civil rights experience, again, not being from that era. What I've learned and heard from it, from people who did go to era, it was driven by young people. It was so many young people. Remember, John Lewis was in his 20s, and he was one of the speakers at the March on Washington, which is gonna be commemorated uh, uh, this, this weekend, it's commemorated. Mm -hmm. so, it's, um, it, so that young man brought so much energy and, but chant in the right way, say we want freedom and we want rights now. And so praise God for that. And so the more we can do to help um, create spaces, and I think education and I think our church spaces should be, uh, they, they take the top, the top rung in terms of how we can help our young people um, to learn and to grow and to share. Thank you, Father. Um, one of those uh, I guess, points of uh, disconnect um, for uh, some of our youth. Uh, one of the questions was they've seen some Catholic accounts which are mainly only focused on racial injustices when it's related to abortion. Um, and so the, the question from that is, uh, is racism a life issue that should be treated with the same seriousness as abortion? There's no doubt that racism is a, a life issue. 
and that's, that's there are many uh, articles and, and conversations about that. Um, abortion is is obviously the most egregious tax on life because we're talking about um, innocent life, and it's something that we can never forget um, to the sacredness of all life. Um, but I think we have not always placed racism in that same conversation as a pro-life issue. It is. As I mentioned in my opening thoughts today about Mr. George Floyd, you know, um, that, that's, that's not how a person who believes in the sacredness of life uh, conducts herself and himself. So it's, it's critical that we understand that issue as it is something. We need to have more intentionality in talking about racism and what we've done to divide people. Um, and again, and that's systemic roles of it. It's not just something that a bad word we say, but it's deeper than that. Um, and, and it's ways we have excluded people from political conversations, excluded people from, from jobs, education, opportunities that are there. That has been part of, and, we, and as, as, as Catholics who believe in, in life, we, we have to be concerned about all life that is sacred to God. Uh, one of my blessings I've had as a priest in my ministry is to, to mentor a man who was incarcerated. And I did that because uh, as a black man from Philadelphia, um, I've been very blessed to have great family, uh, faith, uh, parishes and schools that really helped me uh, to make good choices. Uh, and of course, with God's tremendous grace in my life, never to be caught up in a criminal justice system. But um, just moved to, to, to want to walk with somebody as he came out of prison. And um, it's been a blessing to my life. And he certainly has not returned to that life. Uh, he has been able to make better choices with his anger, uh, to channel it in a different way, uh, to have a job, to take care of his children. And it's been a real blessing to me. But it's helped me to realize that um, the life in the womb is sacred. The life in the nursing home is sacred. But the life in the prison is sacred, too. And that's why um, we, we cannot stand with the issue of a, of a death penalty. Although the church may say this, that the state has a right to do that, it ought not to take that right because life is sacred. And so back to the point about uh, racism, we, we have to get the new eyes that, that Christ wants us to have to see in each person the dignity they have. Because if I believe that you are my sister or my brother in Christ, um, and I'm loved by God, for example, Black life matters. Well, black life, I have to, my life has to be sacred to me. And to believe that as a, as a, as a man, as a black man, as a, as a priest, I am, I'm God's child. And when I understand that and believe I am God's child, it changed how I see you. You're God's child too. So I cannot fail to forgive you if I've been forgiven by God. So I understand that, but it changed how I behave myself. So. It goes back to that point about pro-life as being truly a deep respect for yourself, and that turns itself outward to respect you as well. Thank you, Father. Another uh, point of uh, disconnect, um, I think, uh, and just um, disagreement from the questions uh, that we received. Uh, as Catholics, how should we view and approach uh, Black Lives Matter? What can and cannot be supported from the Black Lives Matter movement? It's a very uh, important conversation. It's very important. Um, we must make a distinction between the three words, Black Lives Matter, with the organization and the movement itself. Um, as Catholics, we, we need to affirm that Black life matters because uh, that is who we are, because uh, life matters to God. So Black Lives Matters, the phrase Black Lives Matter, uh, affirms a truth that black people are sacred to God. Mm -hmm. um, and it also pushes against uh, a history in our country, in our church, where we have not always respected the gifts of black Catholics and the black people in general. So that's part of our history and we can't deny that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an affirmation of that. Um, the organization, the movement has many pieces to it. And I, even myself, I, I try my best to keep up with it. And it, it's very, even the website's very in terms of the platform, it's varied in terms of how it's lived out in certain parts of our country. So what, what, how it's expressed in Chicago may be very different than New Orleans. Uh, and there are pieces of it that are not consistent with our church. 
And so it, it, it moves us to a place of elevating our minds, to read, to learn, um, to grow. Archbishop Laurie in Baltimore, uh, Archbishop Baltimore, what a beautiful piece on how black life matters is consistent with our Catholic church teaching. It's very well done. I encourage people to read it. Uh, but also, he's very clear about the, the obviously, he does not affirm um, all the tenets of that platform. But it's important for us to understand um, to be very, uh, it's where our young people and their education and their energy uh, and conferences like this one today is helpful to, to be informed, to have your conscience and your mind informed. Part of our faith is to know. Um, the first part of the catechism is all on, was on creed. So before we get to sacraments and morality and prayer, the catechism is, is uh, in fact, over a third of it is on the faith. So we cannot celebrate something in worship and the sacraments uh, we don't know. We cannot live something we don't know. So even our morality, it makes no sense at all. Like, why should I forgive you unless I know I've been forgiven? Why should I realize that sexual relations belong between a man and a woman in the bond of marriage, open to life. If I don't understand the gift of sexuality, so all that is based upon understanding our faith. And so uh, it does invite us to really to, not just to take everything we hear on television um, at first glance, and to, to read, understand, to be elevated, so we can be able to make good choices. But yes, my life does matter. So does yours, but my life is important. Amen. Thank you for that, Father. Um, yeah, so you mentioned uh, the uh, learning and, and also uh, earlier you mentioned a lot of having the conversations. I think um, uh, beyond that, uh, what is it that youth, especially those that we have that are under 18 that are minors, um, how can they take action? You know, I think that everybody wants to do something, but on these issues, social issues like race inequality uh, and injustice locally, nationally, and globally, and how does that relate to Catholic social teaching? Sure. I'm going to go back again to the Bishop's document. There, there are 11 strategies that they offer in uh, Open Wide Our Hearts, and I encourage um, all of us to, to read it, reread it again. Um, it's a simple document. It's nothing really deep or profound, but it, it lays out our faith through scripture and tradition that's very clear. And it gives us um, some moments. One of us is encounter. I, I use that word, Pope Francis uh, uses it a lot. I, I love that phrase, encounter. When we encounter people that are different than ourselves, uh, so I invite our young people, whether at their schools or other opportunities, to, to intentionally listen and get to know someone who's different than themselves. And that could be very simply, and even this virtual space of going to a site or going to um, a podcast or something that really gives you a chance to learn something different from someone different than themselves. A chance to worship in a different faith community, a different uh, a cultural community that may be helpful to say, wow, I didn't realize that this group worships this way or they're both, and they're all Catholic and, and that's part of our faith tradition as well. Um, those are ways we can begin to really, and I, I think also to, to raise up your voices. I, I think in our schools, if you, you're not being, um, hearing anything about African-American history, to ask that question. That's, that's, a, that's a very valid question for a student to ask uh, their administrator or their principal or their teachers. Um, I have a calendar from the, the Josephites uh, brothers. Uh, they have a brothers and fathers, a beautiful calendar out, which is, uh, has every day a different, um, uh, a different saint, of course, as a celebrated, and then also a, a, a black history fact. So I just look at it every day and it gets me, I didn't know that. I didn't know that person was born this day. And it, so it's both sacred and secular. So those things we can begin to really expose ourselves and to grow and to learn uh, are helpful to, to bridging us together. But encounter um, information uh, is, is another way we can do it. And also service. I find when young people come together and do service, uh, it's a great way to use your energy as someone who um, led service projects as a high school teacher and, and worked in campus ministry. Um, I'm very much aware of that young people. And we, we come together and do something like that, especially when it's, it's in different groups. Again, back to my parish experience, um, there's a parish in, in Parksburg, Pennsylvania. It's, it's, a, it's a, probably the most rural part of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, uh, far, far away, you know, and, um, and uh, literally, you know, uh, roads and 
think it's dark and, and you see cows and all the things that's the opposite of what you see in urban Philadelphia where I live. And so it's cars and it's noise and concrete. So um, it was great that the, uh, the, young, uh, the youth minister there wanted to come uh, and bring a, a group of young people to have experience of, of going to the city. Only, you know, not that many miles away, but about a two hour ride, but they drove here to North Philadelphia. And I said, on the one condition, we go out there too. Uh, I said, we have to go out there as well. We just can't simply have you come to us. And because that's relationship. Otherwise you just come and have an experience in the, the black community in the urban city. Uh, but that's not enough. So they came here, we had pizza, we played basketball, it was great. We went out there and we milked cows. And so, <laughs> and a lot of our kids had never even seen a cow before, let alone milk the cow. Um, but that's, that's wonderful. So, I, so our youth groups can intentionally come together and say, we want to go and have those experiences that are great. Um, we have a sister parish, um, again, in a, in a suburban community. And for the last nine years I've been pastor here, we go there, they come here. But it was wonderful this past year because our choir sings gospel music there. Their choir would listen and enjoy it. And I said, wait a minute, that's not, that's not a full ex exchange. You have to come and sing in our church. And, uh, and the pastor, well, we don't sing like you. I said, exactly. You're not us. And it was great because they came and sang the songs they would sing in their parish in our church. And it was wonderful. But even better than that, they sang one song together called Total Praise. Mm. And it was beautiful to see 50 some voices of black and white, young and old, male and female singing God's praises. That's heaven, that's church. And the more we can do that, the more we're gonna bring the kingdom of God right here on earth. Amen. Well, thank you, Father. Um, you mentioned- I didn't um, cows, by the way. I, I don't know cows. <laughs> yeah. I, I watched. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, you, earlier you mentioned uh, for, important for us to form our conscience as young people. I think uh, especially, well, everybody being home, it's been a lot of media. And so uh, as Catholics, how should we approach and analyze uh, local, national, and global news sources? And how can we discern um, objective facts from what we consume? Sure. Excellent point. Uh, the first thing is um, always through the lens of Christ in the church. Always. And so um, I, I tell, we cannot and we will not ever tell someone how to vote. That's not consistent. But the church must be in the public square. We have a responsibility to take the, to the streets. That is part of our, our, the mandate of Christ. Go be therefore and teach all nations. And many times we see, just a few weeks ago, we had the Jesus encountering the Canaanite woman. So he goes to a region outside of the Jewish territory and encounters her, this beautiful exchange where she ends up having her, her prayer requests answered. Her daughter is healed at the very moment. So the church must be in the public square, but do so through the lens of Christ. So I was encouraged as a pastor and as an educator uh, to read, to read critically, not to just assume everything uh, because I hear it, okay, uh, just to, it must be true. To, to, to get as much facts as possible. Um, I'm, a, I'm one who loves politics, so I watch both the Democrat and the Republican convention together uh, because I want to get as much information as possible so I can discern what is best and what's most consistent for me. And so I think it's very important to, to, to get that information, to, to read and to, and to have, um, you know, that's where our, our role as priests and bishops and, and catechists come in, to give people the truth um, because that's how they're called to grow. And so um, even if someone doesn't want to hear it or doesn't agree with it, um, my responsibility is to be consistent with the majesty of the church, to be very clear what the church teaches and to put my own personal opinions aside and make sure I'm consistent with that. And so uh, that formation is critical. And, um, and again, I encourage people to, to, to read. There's a lot of the things we see that perhaps are on the internet or even that they've been shared by even experts, quote unquote, um, are not consistent with our faith. So I tell people, bring your Bible, <laughs> bring your catechism, bring your energy, and, and, and take your faith um, in the world. Uh, that's why we need great Catholic politicians and great Catholic people in, in, in the business square and, and other opportunities to really bring the faith and make sure it's alive, it's ethical, that's consistent with who we are. And so um, 
that's part of my role in Sunday to teach the faith so people can live it as best they can. Wow. Thank you, Father. Uh, on, on that note, um, because I think we could ask you questions forever, but uh, you're already mentioning there are ways that maybe we can take this beyond just this 45 minutes we had. Um, and I already know you mentioned some of them, maybe to reiterate some, or are there other resources that you would uh, really recommend for us to start uh, when it comes to understanding the current state of North America in relation to social justice and helping us to start moving forward? First of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really I did not know about this organization. It's great. I've, I've, lear I've learned something. And I think it's great to, to, to be as inclusive as possible. Um, our God is a big God. And our church is big. I think sometimes we get caught the idea that the church is my little parish, my little diocese, my little part of the world. And when we, when we travel and we see, when I went to Rome for the first time, I remember going um, and looking at the beautiful Basilica of St. Peter's and saying, I'm home in the heart of the church. And um, my Americanness, my, my blackness, all that was secondary to my Catholic faith. And so, and I bring that to the table and that's been celebrated in my church. And so the more we can um, think big and in intentionally include things that are out of our comfort zone perhaps, it's gonna help us to, to do the work of justice. So again, to read, uh, to, to find opportunities that are available that we can learn. Again, in, in this space of COVID, we can certainly just Google it. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll be able to, in a safe way, um, and even students that are able to, uh, young people able to have uh, a different, our country is a big country, so there may be parts of the country that really can have some encounter, whether it's at school or on campuses, but um, the more we can encounter new experiences that are gonna help us to grow, it's gonna make us, um, move against the tide of racism and have a strong constitution to realize that when we attack someone or we don't recognize their dignity based upon their race, uh, it goes against the church. Because racism is a sin. I haven't said that yet, I wanna be very clear. The church is clear about the fact it is a sin and it's wrong and it goes against everything that we were consistent with in our Catholic teaching. And so it's important to realize that um, and to find all the ways we can and all the resources to the reading and the, for the social media, the things that are going to help us. But nothing's more important than having conversations and questions and answers and, and relationships. And, uh, and I always say, we have food there too. It makes it even better. So food and dance, celebration, all those things, we come to realize that we really are part of one human family and we're part of one beautiful church. And um, we hear uh, recently uh, Jesus saying that the gates of hell will not prevent, prevail against our church. I'm a man of hope, and I believe in hope. And I believe the fact that uh, our God has not abandoned us. These are troubled times and challenging times, uh, but our God is with us. So it's important to realize that. And the great St. John Paul II, he said something I want to just share that I love. He met with um, Black Catholics in 1987. He's the first and only uh, Holy Father to meet with us as a group. I was not there, but I, I remember hearing uh, his, his talk that day. And he said, there is no black church. There is no white church. There is no American church. There is one church, but it must be a home for black people, for white people, for American people, for all people. So um, he's, he's saying that we have to make sure the table is as full as possible that we all come to one table and to respect each other's differences, to see their commonalities together and be able to build the beloved community that, that our God wants us to have. Thank you so much, Father. You're this welcome. has been uh, such a blessing. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, hopefully just the beginning of many more encounters, uh, hopefully with you and uh, of course, other communities all around us. Uh, so thank you for really giving us a vision forward. It's been such a blessing. Can I bless the participants now that they offer blessing? Patrick? Yeah. Oh, well, before that, it's, oh. it's our custom to sort of uh, pray over our priest, uh, any priest that helps us, if that's okay. <laughs> All right. So let's acknowledge God's presence, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And just extend our hands over Father Stephen. Thank you so much, Lord. 
for sending uh, Father Stephen to us and just allowing us, Lord, to um, have this insight, this experience, this wisdom, this perspective that's outside of our community, Lord. Thank you for, through his stories and through his uh, generosity with his time, Lord, that we were able to encounter you in a new way, um, to open our eyes to uh, the different experiences, Lord, that people, um, even that other people of faith are also experiencing. So, Father, just thank you uh, for whatever words that Father Stephen spoke that touched our hearts individually. Um, we just ask, Lord, that you would bless his ministry there in St. Martin de Porres and uh, any other places, Lord, that um, you ask him to speak to, any people you ask him to encounter. Lord, just continue to bless him, give him energy, um, give him motivation. We especially ask, Lord, that you would bless him in times of quarantine when he feels lonely as a priest. Lord, just continue to shower your grace and your presence upon him. I remind him he's never alone and especially moments like this, Lord, that he has been such a blessing to us, Father. I just ask that you would remind him that he is being used by you and blessing people everywhere that he goes. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, this, uh, this posture that I'm in right now, that is the posture of prayer and a posh openness. And so uh, I, I pray and thank you for that blessing and that, that gift and on all the, the young people at this conference. And I ask... Um, the Lord give you his peace and his love. And I ask our Blessed Mother, Queen of Peace, to give you that gift and, and to go forth and bring that good news to all the world. May Almighty God bless all of you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth in peace. Thank you, Father. Amen. God bless you. God bless. Bye, Father. Bye-bye now. All right, let's give it up to Brother Patrick and uh, Father Stephen. Woo! All right, so now we're going to go to our guide questions. All right, so our guide questions for tonight come to like two questions. So what concrete steps can I take to encourage conversations in my family on the evil reality of racism? Number two, what concrete actions can I take to better understand the plight of our black brothers and sisters and how can i be an instrument of peace bringing god's message of the dignity of all human life in a way that honors god all right so the thing is like we don't have like enough like time for the discussion group so the thing is like it's like a good like guide questions so we can bring to our households and um also as, a, as we echoed from the the answers that father torn has given is a racism is a life issue. So we have invited a member of the CFC Gift of Life National Core Group to provide us with some information on how we can continue to uphold the dignity of all human life. So she's our sister. Um, her name is uh, Tita Michelle Reyes. A uh, background about her is like she's uh, married to her beloved Noriel for 37 years and blessed with two adult daughters ages 36 and 22, and two granddaughters, ages seven and three. Michelle and her husband have been in CFC since 1994 and currently serving as sector heads for CFC SoCal. Uh, she's a loan closing and servicing manager for a boutique um, commercial mortgage banking firm in Orange County, California. And she's also our CFC Gift of Life National Director. Let's give it up to Tita Michelle Reyes. Good evening. And once again, thank you very much for the opportunity you know, to speak with you tonight. Patrick, I thank you for the conversation between you and Father Stephen that you shared with us tonight. I'd like to um, make a shout out to, dear, to a dear and longtime friend who I noticed is on tonight. Oz from SFC Hawaii, it's nice to see you. Mark, thank you for facilitating this conversation tonight. I'm sure we all agree that 2020 has really been a historic year and has really raised our awareness of the serious threats to human life and dignity with each issues such as racism, the environment, poverty, abortion, and other such issues raised to the forefront. 
I'm not sure if you guys remember, but in June 2020, what that's four months ago at the height of the racial tension protests, our CFC leaders issued the statement, our United Call to Action Peace. And um, peace acronym stood for prayer, education, where they're asking us to continue to educate ourselves on the history and real consequences of racism, A for advocacy. Let us be instruments of healing and restoration as we join others to advocate and promote justice at all levels to combat racism. Conversations, Father spoke to this a, a lot, we, where we're called to open, be open to conversations, but also to look deeply into ourselves to recognize the reality of our own prejudices and biases and of course encounter to encounter Christ in each other that we need to actively reach out and listen and understand the stories of those who have been affected directly by racism so I urge you my dear SFC brothers and sisters to please go back to that document and um, read it again in your households and really find out how you can come Greatly respond in your own localities. So we need you, we CFC need you, our SFC brothers and sisters. We need your voice and involvement in the work that promotes the dignity of human life, regardless of the circumstances of this life. So we encourage you to please join us on November 7 and November 14. The flyer is right in front of you to learn more about the Gift of Life Ministry and see how you can get involved. So um, the details of the event are right here. If you're not able to capture this, I'm sure Patrick or Tina or your co-host will be able to give you that information. My challenge to you tonight is to take the lead. Again, take the lead. Take on concrete steps in your local communities. Engage in respectful conversations to better understand and in love and respect, help others understand and grow in understanding. Find concrete ways, find your own social justice cause that you want to get involved in, be it the environment, human trafficking, poverty, abortion, racism, find your own issue and get involved to make the world a better place. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Tita Michelle. So I thank you, everyone, for participating and joining this workshop. And also, like, I thank you, the speakers, once again, for Brother Pat and also uh, Father Stephen. We love